today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Look forward to it. So I wanted to get started asking about you um, both coming back to the series to produce the prequel and what was the inspiration in making this film and get, really getting the project started. Sure, yeah. The, the um, you know, we love making the first film. It was a different kind of horror story. It was really less overt than most of what we would, we had seen and and when we got done with that movie and it was well received a lot of what came back to us was a desire from the audience for more mythology and to understand uh where these characters might have come from before and where the evil actually originated so you know there was an obvious chapter in the book um the timmy baderman story that had never been committed to film or, or explored in film and you know and and since that character connected to you know, give us an opportunity to see a young version of John Lithgow of of, of Judd. Um, it felt like a natural place to go for the next story, a prequel rather rather than a sequel. And also, I wanted to ask you both about serving as producers, just in general, on the prequel now and coming back, and just what was your overall approach in pro producing the prequel as well? Um, well having done the first movie and we thought well and the audience seemed to agree with us you know you had certain things about it that what what did the world look like certain things that we sort of almost predetermined because of the first movie um but then in this case because of the subject matter and because we we opened up the cast to characters that are new um that took you into a different kind of emotional territory and so you know, that that was an interesting thing. Where does Donna live? What does it look like what she where she lives? How much of her heritage is represented by the choice? Um, things like that that then changed, in a sense, partly the design of the movie. Um, and And I think we drew on Vietnam in different ways for different ones. I'm old enough to remember the experience of people come, not coming home. Um, and it was it, the sense of placing it in the 60s was both logical because we were trying to do the younger Judd Crandall and that connected to Judd L uh, John Lithgow. Um, so it and, and in the book, it's it's war that that I guess initiates the Biederman story. So, uh but that's our moment in time in America for a lot of people, the loss of innocence. And I think the story for our, certainly our surviving characters, um, if you've survived this movie, you've lost your innocence. You know, our three characters who do survive, it, it, life will never be the same again. You know, that that is reality. And so, we chose to do things like the sunflower fields because the contrast of the gorgeous openness and the terrible darkness really are interesting and represent exactly that what that innocence was, if you would. And now you'd never look at a sunflower field in the same way. And also speaking about the locations in the film, I also wanted to ask you both about that. And I'm going back to Montreal to film this movie and what that experience was like in really creating the look of the locations for the film as well. The uh we love shooting in Montreal. It's a great, it's a great, beautiful town. Uh a little bit different under COVID. So it was uh you know uh it was challenging time to be there. Canada had very strict rules for us, but um you know what was great about what's great about Montreal for this movie is the the wilderness looks very similar to the wilderness in Maine, and also there's a lot of towns outside of the city of Montreal that were sort of lost in time a little bit that had not been updated or you know so the buildings and structures and real locations we were shooting in the hockey rink things like that uh were time capsules they look like the 60s still and that ends up on a on a horror movie where you're not spending a lot of money um it ends up being you know a real bounty for the look of the film 
one thing I wanted to ask about getting to work with Lindsay is one of the writers on the film and also the director and what your collaboration was like together on set and really getting the film together. Well, we had worked with her before. She had come in a couple of high pressure situations. And anytime you go with a first time director, one of your biggest questions is how they're going to react under pressure. So we knew that. We knew what a talented writer she was. And then, you know, then every director has to prove that their understanding of the material is such that they're the right choice. And in the, we met several directors and just her, both her passion for the material and her understanding of the material really stood, stood out. Um, and we've made movies before with first time directors. So we understood what it is they needed to be supported with too. Also with the cast in the film, I also wanted to ask about how involved you were in finding the actors, especially with Jackson Wade and playing the younger version of Judd and what that process was like of um, really finding the actors who would appear in the film. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, um, we had two, two, we had the adults in the movie and we had the kids in the movie, right? So it was sort of two very different things on the adult casting. Um, um, with Samantha and David and and, and um, uh, Henry and all of them, I mean, we wanted we wanted well known faces, right? It's often a challenge to cast young people because you don't have a marketing hook for them because they're not yet uh, famous. And so we were amazed at the people, the the talent, the quality of the talent that was drawn for the adult roles. And then for the kids, and especially Jackson, it was an important role because we already had uh, John Lithgow as the older version of Judd Crandall, and we had to, in some ways, work backwards from there. But our story was about, you know, the, as Lorenzo said, the, you know, in some sense, the loss of, uh, of optimism, the loss of innocence. And so you wanted a face and a persona that had that innocence represented in you know, in volume, and that was him, and and he and he was able to make the journey from that innocence to the loss of innocence, um, and ended up being the yeah. perfect cast. And you know, it's interesting. You never really think about it this way, but it sucks being an adult. You have to accept responsibility, <laughs> right? And in this case, Jackson's character can't leave. He has to ex accept the responsibility, and so you mm -hmm. need a guy who could both feel um hopeful and optimistic and and looking outward to somebody who's willing to look inward and take the yoke really of the mythology well working with Lindsay um as the writer on the film as well as speaking of the mythology of how involved were you and really helping her create the origin story and were you involved in that aspect of like really creating the story for the film as well yeah, um, Jeff Bueller, who wrote the first movie for us, wrote the uh, first drafts of, of this movie. And I think um, when Lindsay read those, she she quickly decided she wanted to tell that story. She loved the idea of doing Timmy's story, uh, but she had a lot of her own ideas that she brought to the table that we worked through. Maybe we had too many ideas in the beginning, which tells you how rich this, yeah. the material was. Uh, uh, we got into Bill Baderman's wife. We got into, you know, uh, too many time periods, actually, in, in a certain sense. And we had to sort of boil it all down. But she wanted to tell the story like Stand By Me of three friends who grew apart. And I think that we knew was the emotional core of this movie that was relatable. And even though you had a supernatural situation here, at the at the end of the day, it was really about a time when, uh, people were pulled apart during Vietnam and all of that, and everyone had, um, you know, um, different opportunities or lack of opportunity and all of that. And and Lindsay also wanted to, because the book had not delved too, too heavily into the Native American part of this story and the land and the taking of, of the land, um, that was really a, a very deep layer um, that we worked hard to, to add to the story that was in the book. While I was watching the film, I also liked the music that was included and felt that it really kind of helped the 
really emphasize like the loss of innocence, like you both mentioned, and the mythology of the story, and um, how involved were you in really helping create the score and selecting the music as well? Good, good. Well, it's interesting. The imagery and the music and the sound were three things we focused a lot on because we felt it d distinguishes uh, some of my perspective on a lot of horror films is they don't spend the money to really actualize a great look or or sound. Um, so a lot of this movie depends on the sound uh, or lack of sound. And, and, you know, one of the things, and also the music tells you the time period and it gives you emotional cues and how you're supposed to experience it. But, you know, one of the big images in this movie is the sunflower field. And it, it's, it's both um, visually stunning but it's also in contrast to the evil that's coming. And it's also ironically something that is very temporary in real life. They, Mark, you were saying like in two days, they go from bloom to dying. Um, and so that's sort of the temporary nature of life. So we think a lot about those different kinds of things and don't always come up with the most clever answers, but hopefully we try. Also, um, speaking of the visuals and going along with the score as well, how involved were you both in working with the cinematographer and the camera department and really telling the visual aspect of the story? Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, that's a big part of it. It's, um, Benjamin was um, relatively new. He came from Europe. We had a hard time getting him into the country. Uh, it's always tricky during COVID, but also in general, uh, the rules of filmmaking in Canada require certain crew members be local, et cetera. So we worked hard to get a young DP who had a real vision uh, onto the movie. And, you know, uh, we looked at equipment, lens packages, all of those details. He brought a, you know, specific lens package in and we were, you know, playing with the idea of the um, conveying the, the point of view of the evil. It ended up being less, prevalent in the movie than what we shot, but I think it was kind of a an interesting idea because this evil inhabits a human body and looks through the eyes of that that person. So we wanted you to have a sense of, you know, this thing seeing the world for the first time or, you know, because that's the book, book conveys a lot of that, like it wants to walk amongst us. It wants to see what we do. It wants to hear how we talk. It wants to know what scares us. And, um, you know, and so much of that is about the the cinematography and, and the beauty of this, this uh, movie, the colors, everything. So much of that uh, came from, from Benjamin. <laughs> And now with the film um, premiering tonight at Fantastic Fest, the, what has that experience been like for you both as well and gearing up to premiere the movie there and sharing it with the audiences at the festival? Well, it's funny because when you're making them after, in post-production, you end up watching bits and pieces of the movie over and over and over and over again. And you begin to get a little desensitized to it and a little bit confused about it in a way about how good is it or not and and so when you go to the premiere especially with an audience that's so well grounded in the genre and has passion for this particular ip um you know there's a there's definitely some judgment that you're 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 waiting to hear but also how well does it play is really one of those unbelievably great feelings when you realize the audience you were hoping to love it does. And that is really, I think, one of the most satisfying things about making a film. You know, you are not making it for yourself, you're making it for a lot of people. Okay, I think that was mainly it, but thank you both again for taking the time to speak with me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. Great, thanks again. Mm -hmm.